Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. There's some truth to the notion goats will eat anything. While goats make great grazers, they're really better browsers. Goats may or may not eat everything, but they'll at least try. Last summer, officials in Montpelier wanted to find a way to control the spread of poison ivy along the city's recreation path without using herbicides. The solution? Get somebody's goat? or goats, as it turns out. It worked so well that the city is bringing back the goats this year. Across the Fence spoke with the herder as the goats were eating away at the problem that's plagued the Vermont capital. The goats are somewhat, you know, focusing on poison ivy, but really we're doing just kind of a, a grazing, you know, run through with the goats where they're gonna eat everything, pretty much. The focus was the poison ivy. Hopefully, we knew goats eat it, we knew they can, but the test, there's so much poison ivy that there is a limit to a goat's poison ivy intake. And we've reached it, and we're, we're attempting to see when it's finished and when they can go back to eating it. But they're awesome because like, you, you just, they just stop eating it. If it's this bad and we don't spray, we don't do anything, like it, it's gonna be a situation where they gorge again and then don't touch it because there's just too much of it. So I think that going with these natural solutions and really doing test patches that, I mean, heck, we're behind a high school. Like we can come here, science, chemistry class that I probably flunked out of, come out here. And you know, cause this is the way you learn. This is to me the fun application of science. They're working goats. There's companies out West with hundreds of goats who, who seem to like offer a franchise to people so that they can partially own the goats and take them out to different jobs. So maybe in a way, I don't know what this will all look like in five years, and especially not in 10 years. I have hopes, but I think it's also an opportunity for other people to get involved and for them to have a business that's good for the environment, that's good for the animals, and then it's good for humans to to not manage animals, and, but to like take care of them, foster them, raise them. They love people, they love, this is like, they stop eating only when there's visitors, basically. When this gets done and we take up the fences and you bring your goats back, what, what are you gonna do with the goats? Wash, wash them. I'm just gonna like Tyvek suit myself out and wash them with like apple cider vinegar, baking soda, I mean, we're gonna have like a whole day, the car, everything. That's the other thing I've learned is how to manage a toxic substance situation of like the gloves, the clothing, like, I don't know. You just, I, it was in their hooves. So if I approached them in their field at home in shorts, as I did, and had no plans of like, you know, rubbing up on them per se, like had gloves, they jump on you, cut your leg, you have poison ivy, you can't even wash it out. I'm learning, I think, tricks of the trade for the next year of doing this with more goats. Our thanks to Mary Beth and her three goats, Ruth, Bader, and Ginsburg. You might be interested to know a group of goats is known as a tribe. So we wish Mary Beth and her tribe good hunting this summer. For our next story, we travel from the river bottom of Washington County, Upland, way up. UVM researchers have been studying red spruce trees on Mount Mansfield for decades. For a species once threatened by acid rain, red spruce are now thriving. Rebecca Gollin tells us how the red spruce revival happened in the Green Mountains. The toll road in Stowe might seem like an unlikely place to find a news story, but there is one here and it's good news. What we, I found during that project was that, yes, they've recovered, but the trees actually were growing better than they had in the entire record of their growth. Even a tree this size can, uh, can be, you know, 
40, 50 years old sometimes. <laughs> Alexandra Kasiba is a staff scientist with the University of Vermont's Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. She's talking about red spruce trees and a study she completed that produced some unexpected results. So this was really surprising. We expected them to, you know, recover, but maybe just kind of go back to status quo. And here they were growing great, growing amazing. And so this opened up, this is how science and research happens. You stumble upon stuff a little bit unexpectedly. To understand Kasiba's surprise, we have to take a step back and look at why red spruce was an important species in Vermont. It was so valued that when Americans cleared the land in the 1800s to have hill farms and have sheep, uh, it was the dominant tree that they were cutting out, building with, but also exporting. Burlington as a, as a, uh, a timber uh, mecca uh, exported a lot of its red spruce up and down the Lake Champlain through the Richelieu, etc. So it was a species that kind of loved to death. <laughs> Paul Schauberg is a forest uh, health really and productivity exactly specialist with the U.S. Forest Service. He or, comes in to investigate uh, when there are unexplained that, or unexpected changes in tree health. Tree species suddenly starts to decline. It's, it's, the crowns are dying or its growth is going down, and we can't figure out why. It's not insects on the, on the tree or something. Then we start doing studies to try to uh, evaluate what's going on, why, and, you know, can we correct that? Schaberg has been studying red spruce trees here in Vermont for decades. Red spruce, from a human standpoint, is an amazing tree. It has uh, a straight stem. It grows very well normally. Um, it has very strong, lightweight wood. It, it's great for construction, but it's also really great for uh, making musical instruments. In the 1970s, researchers noticed that the red spruce that remained, mainly at higher elevations on mountains and hillsides, were dying. But that wasn't the only thing going on then. That decline coincided with when we first realized that the precipitation coming down, uh, uh, rain, snow, and fog water, um, was very acid. It was. Um, this had been discovered in, in Europe, where, where industrialization happened much earlier and pollution standards were pretty much non-existent. But it was only with someone in New Hampshire at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest uh, studying the, the water cycle saying, oh, let's, let's measure the pH of this, that they were, you know, shocked. It was, uh, you know, hundreds of times more acidic than what they thought it should. It was a puzzle for scientists at the time. They knew that the precipitation was highly acidic and that the red spruce, a formerly dominant tree in the area, was declining for no apparent reason. That's when they began to wonder if there was a link between the two. Folks like Hub Vogelman at, at uh, uh, UVM uh, started saying, I wonder if these are connected. Um, and that began uh, actually a, a tremendous scientific effort. UVM professor of botany, Hub Vogelman, was crucial to the discoveries that came next. To begin with, Hub, just how serious do you think the acid rain problem is? Well, I, we think it's, it's quite serious and uh, probably more serious than a lot of people uh, believe today. Here's a picture I took a couple of years ago. It's at an elevation of about uh, 3,000 feet on Camel's Hump. It's facing west uh, toward the Champlain Valley. You can see a large number of dead trees, including the, uh, well, mostly they're dead uh, spruces. The work of Vogelman and others led to the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act, which reduced the sulfur and nitrogen that were the main culprits in making the precipitation so acidic. But Schaberg was not done with red spruce just yet. We kept, we kept looking at, at red spruce. So we actually, in the 1990s and early 2000s, figured out what was the mechanism. What was it about acid deposition that was reducing um, the cold tolerance of red spruce and making it um, uh, susceptible to freezing injury? It was the last piece of the puzzle about why the red spruce was so affected by acid rain. The key was calcium. 
which the acid deposition leaches out of the soil, leaving the tree more vulnerable to the cold. A massive winter injury event in 2003 further damaged Vermont's red spruce population. It was a few years later that Kasiva began the work that led to her study. We were still looking at uh, what we thought would be the downward trajectory of these trees that, that had been so badly damaged in 2003. And indeed, she found that the trees were growing much worse for three and even four or more years after that winter injury event. But she studied that far enough away from that big event that even though there was this, this decline for years, then the trees rebounded and they started growing better and better so that they were growing the best they ever had in their entire lives. And that was, that was shocking. Working with collaborators from around New England and New York, Kasiba looked at samples from over 50 sites. She found that lower amounts of acid precipitation were pivotal to the renewed growth, along with the unique ability of red spruce to use the weather to its advantage. It has this ability to photosynthesize in the winter when it's somewhat warm, when we have those January thaws, or it can take advantage of if we have a really mild fall and all the, the sugar maples and the red oaks have lost their leaves, suddenly these conifers are just sitting there. Red spruce has this ability to then take advantage. Well, this is certainly good news for the red spruce, the work of these researchers is not done. We now have a remarkably good understanding of the trajectory and the niche of red spruce, a very important species, but red spruce grows in a forest with lots of other species. Um, and one obvious question that comes up is, so red spruce is doing all right, what about these other trees? It's, it's a great story for right now. And we don't know what the future will hold for red spruce and for other trees in our forest. And that's why we continue to research these things and, and look at growth, look at physiology, look at how climate and environmental factors are affecting these trees, because we need to understand those uh, dynamics to predict uh, future changes and, wh and what will happen. It's a good news story for now, but the ending still isn't written. And that's why these researchers don't plan to stop until all of their questions are answered. In Stowe, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. That's our program for today. Once again, thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. <laughs>